Butler's Rangers was a provincial corps that was raised for service for the duration of the American Revolution. The corps was authorized on the 15th of September, 1777, and was commanded by John Butler. John Butler was commander of the Butler's Rangers, which of course were formed during the American Revolution, and John Butler was also a friend uh, of Sir William Johnson, who was then the superintendent of Indian Affairs. And when Sir William passed away, John, because of his close association with the Six Nations people, uh, was put in that position to take care of their affairs, knowing the languages and so on. The uh, Butler's Rangers were people that lived in, in what, what is now known uh, primarily New York State. They were farmers, merchants, um, people of prominence, um, a wide range of, uh, of type of personalities that were called to uh, arms uh, by the king, but they were not in the regular forces. And that's the reason they wore the green uniform with the red facing. They were provincials. They'd lived in this land. And the nationalities were varied. They were just, just common folk that were colonialists uh, in this country. Butler was aided in his orders by the Iroquois Confederacy. These tribes were known as the Six Nations. They included the Mohawk, Oneida, Cayuga, Onondaga, Tuscarora, and Seneca. They all considered themselves allies and not subject to the crown. My understanding of it is that the, uh, the, uh, because they lived like us, they lived with us, actually the uh, regulars used to call them uh, blue-eyed savages or white savages. They intermarried with our people. Basically, a lot of them were even adopted into some of the nations as well. So they were like family, like very, very, very close ties. Butler's Rangers were composed mainly of volunteers and were charged with conducting missions against the American frontier settlements to destroy food crops that would supply the rebel forces. Another important task was to draw off American continental soldiers from other operations. The rangers were never expected to seize or hold geographical areas. Their operations were of a strike force nature. Every major expedition it mounted contained a First Nations element, sometimes very small, at other times larger than the ranger component itself. The Corps was organized, uniformed and equipped on the British Infantry Battalion model. The Six Nations and Butler's Rangers lived and fought together for many years. In fact, the numbers of Butler's Rangers were established at 10 companies, totaling 591 in all ranks. It wasn't unusual to see 10 to 50 Rangers on a mission supported by 200 to 300 Six Nations warriors. If it weren't for their support, Butler's Rangers would certainly have failed to prevent American incursion. When we came back to our home. Butler's Rangers mounted many offensive expeditions into the American heartland areas such as New York, Wyoming, Cherry Valley, Mohawk Valley, Ohio, and as far south as Kentucky. At one particular encounter, Butler defeated an American force led by the famous Daniel Boone. Daniel, it is said, was last seen swimming for his life. Most of the rangers decided to settle in the Niagara Peninsula. They received free land grants as United Empire loyalists. The Butler's rangers were disbanded on the 24th of June, 1784. Present-day Southern Ontario was part of the old colony of Quebec and divided into administrative districts. The Niagara Peninsula was part of the district of Nassau. The earliest reference to the Nassau militia is 1788. Though there is no official direct link between Butler's Rangers and the Lincoln Welland Regiment, they certainly formed the backbone of the Nassau militia, who eventually became the Lincoln militia. Isaac Brock was appointed administrator of the province as well as the general officer commanding in Upper Canada in 1811. One of his first efforts was to introduce into law a provision for compensating the families of militiamen killed or wounded in action. The Lincoln militia were the largest force available to support the British regulars. Not only did they fight alongside them, 
but they also transported ammunition and built roads and fortifications. The Lincoln militia fought at the battles of Queenston Heights, Fort George, Chippewa, and Lundy's Lane. All the regiments of the Lincoln militia proved themselves in battle, even though their equipment and training was not up to par with the British regulars. The 100-year period between 1814 and 1914 was relatively quiet, even though the Fenian raids occurred in 1866. The Fenians were men who supported Irish independence from England. They believed that by acting against Canada, they could force the British out of Ireland. The Fenians attacked across the Niagara River into Canada without any military objective. They moved up the Welland Canal and had a short, sharp fight at Ridgeway and then withdrew back to Fort Erie. By the time the British infantry, supported by the Lincoln militia, arrived at Fort Erie, the Fenians had withdrawn across the river. Although the Lincoln militia had not seen much action, their immediate rush to the colours demonstrated the intense loyalty the men felt when their country was threatened. Men who served during the raids were awarded the Canada General Service Medal and awarded grants of land. Prior to World War I, the Canadian militia was, in fact, the Canadian Army. In Niagara, the two militia infantry units were the 19th Lincoln Regiment and the 44th Lincoln and Welland Regiment located in St. Catharines, Ontario. The two Niagara regiments provided the bulk of the strength on active duty in the Welland Canal Field Force. Men lived under canvas at the armories in St. Catharines and Niagara Falls and at piquettes established along the Welland Canal and hydroelectric facilities in the peninsula. During 1915, the 81st, 98th, and the 176th Battalions were mobilized in the region, and the 19th Lincoln and the 44th Lincoln and Welland Regiments sent overseas 5,409 troops. These troops were absorbed into the reserve to supply reinforcements to the Canadian Expeditionary Forces in the field. The Lynx fought as soldiers of the expeditionary forces and not in their separate regiments. They played vital roles in the major World War I battles, such as Ypres, 1915, Somme, 1916, Arras, 1917 and 1918, Amiens, and the pursuit of the Mont. With the dispersal of the men as reinforcements, to tell their story would require the recounting of the history of the Canadian Corps during the war. But there are two men whose stories are at the same time typical of the experience of most of the soldiers sent over by the Niagara militia units and exemplary examples of their character. Frederick William Hill and Graham Thompson Lyle. Frederick William Hill joined the 44th Lincoln and Welland Regiment and at the outbreak of war was the Lieutenant Colonel commanding the regiment. He was one of the first volunteers for active service when the war broke out and was appointed commanding officer of the 1st Battalion, CEF. In January of 1916, Hill was promoted to Brigadier General and commanded the 9th Canadian Infantry Brigade until August of 1918. His conduct in action and leadership earned him the awards of the Order of the Bath, awarded to senior officers for services in action, the Order of St. Michael and St. George, awarded to senior officers for services abroad, and the Distinguished Service Order for gallantry. Graham Thompson Lyle was born in Manchester, England. He joined the 19th Lincoln Regiment as a private soldier. After a year doing active duty with the regiment in the Welland Canal Field Force, he joined the 81st Battalion on its formation 
He went overseas as a private soldier, but was soon promoted to corporal during the battles of the Somme and Vimy Ridge. His conduct and leadership earned him promotion to sergeant and then a battlefield commission. He then was posted to the 102nd Battalion, but on the 27th of September 1918, he won the Victoria Cross at the Battle of Berlin Wood, France. The King is pleased to approve the award of Victoria Cross to Graham Thompson Lyle. He showed throughout the utmost valor and high powers of command. Commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel R.S.W. Fordham received orders to mobilize on the morning of the 26th of August, 1939. By seven o'clock that evening, Fordham's men were positioned to guard against saboteurs along the Welland Canal. As the phony war stretched on in Europe through the winter of 1940, the task of guarding the canal fell to the RCMP, and the unit's wartime future seemed in doubt. Then, in April of 1940, Hitler's armies turned west into Norway and Denmark, then south through Belgium and the Netherlands in May. On the day that the regiment was authorized to recommence active recruiting, the 22nd of June, France capitulated. Suddenly, Canada was Britain's ranking ally. Within a month, a unit that had once seemed destined to spend the war in obscurity boasted a strength of 18 officers and 787 other ranks. What prompted these men to join? Was it the lure of steady pay or a sense of adventure? It was on the 12th of August. The Dieppe raid was on and the Canadians got slaughtered. There was a whole raft of us from the non-permanent that went active service right then. The goal was to go into Europe and to free the countries that had been overrun by the Germans and to free the people. Word was starting to get out, you know, that uh, some of the things that were going on, like these concentration camps and uh, murder of Jews, and uh, at first you didn't take too much attention to it, thought it was propaganda, really. But uh, as things went on, and it became more apparent that this was the truth, and that sooner or later we would have to get rid of these birds. And uh, another thing is, is that I come from a family that was United Empire loyalists, and we believed in fighting for our country. And uh, I couldn't stay out of the army any longer. The big reason was we realized that if Hitler wasn't stopped, he'd be over in this country and he'd be fighting a war here. The whole war effort of Canada was a volunteer effort. And I don't think people realize that, but every one of those guys that went into France with the Lincoln and Welland Regiment was a volunteer. He was there because he wanted to be there, not because he was sent. Four years of training began in the summer of 1940 at Niagara Camp at Niagara-on-the-Lake. The commanding officer was then the popular Lieutenant Colonel Charlie Muir. Everything seemed to be in short supply in those first months. Uniforms, boots, weapons and experience. Veterans of earlier wars imposed some military discipline and basic training. Endless football games and even the occasional exercise nurtured some esprit de corps. But Europe must have seemed far off during those early months. In May of 1941, the people of Niagara Falls came out to see the regiment off for more training in Nanaimo, British Columbia. <laughs> 
Its return home in the fall was brief, for it then immediately headed east. Newfoundland was the regiment's home for the next year and a half, first at Gander Airport, then in St. John's. Through two long winters, the regiment continued to hone its training and its identity. The regiment boasted of three bands in St. John's, as well as a newspaper, the Linkwell. Even after its departure back to Canada in the spring of 1943, the regiment's ties to Newfoundland remained. More than one soldier met their future wife, under Iraq. Three years of wartime training had taken the regiment from one coast to the other. The unit had evolved a great deal, but there was much more to learn. In July of 1943, the officers and men of the Lincoln and Welland Regiment arrived in Scotland, and in one year's time, the regiment would be fighting in France. Immediately, the regiment began to find its place within the 1st Canadian Army as part of the 10th Canadian Infantry Brigade of the 4th Canadian Armoured Division. Exercises with such names as Take X-1 or Grizzly 2 helped the regiment learn the ways of the artillery, machine guns and tanks. In February of 1944, the regiment was rehearsing assault landings in Scotland. Soon after, it was in Sussex, working on river crossings, night patrols and street fighting. As the spring approached, a growing wealth of restrictions hinted that the invasion was imminent. On the 5th of July 1944, a V-1 flying bomb crashed into the regimental positions near Crowborough. When that thing hit the cookhouse, the V-1, we heard it coming down, you see, it, 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 we heard it didn't make any noise coming down. The engine quits and the slides in. And uh, everybody got him, his belly on the ground and lay there. And it went over us about, uh, oh, 7,500 yards past us. It hit a cookhouse, blew up three cooks and killed six more people, killed nine people altogether right there. They were just heaped on top of one another. And there's a Sergeant Major Wing. Uh, he had legs off and he died in the ambulance um, later on. Uh, you know, that day, but uh, we never did find Ralph the cook, but we found his head laying in the golf course, but there's nothing left to, for Ralph. And uh, it was the only uh, battalion in England that experienced that sort of uh, bomb dropping on them directly. The combined Allied forces of American, British, and Canadian troops had broken through the Atlantic Wall on the 6th of June, but the city of Caen had not fallen until the 10th of July. The German defences south of the city withstood repeated costly attacks through late July and early August of 1944. At the centre of the German positions lay the tiny ruined crossroads of Tilly la Campagne. The Battle of Tilly la Campagne, which was really the first uh, action that the Lincoln and Welland were involved in in early August of 1944, it's worth stepping back a little bit and considering something about the Normandy battlefield, which, despite all plans, had really become an extraordinarily awful place. A place where the rates of casualties rivaled the very worst battlefields of the First World War. And Tilly was one of the heart and, and central places where the German defenses most tenacious in order to deny the Canadians advance south of Caen. On the night of the 1st of August, 1944, two platoons of the regiment, about 60 men, launched a diversionary attack on Tilly to aid an assault by the Calgary Highlanders. Both attacks failed. The next night, the Lincoln and Welland Regiment tried again. In less than five hours, the regiment had suffered 64 casualties. We weren't prepared for anything then. It was, a, it was poorly organized. They had sent uh, the Lake Shores in before, and they got slaughtered. They'd sent some English troops in before and they got slaughtered. The Germans were in hull down position with their tanks and, and had uh, breastworks laid along at the edge of Tilly. All they needed to do was walk through there and you get killed. Good friends of mine, wonderful friends of mine, were killed there right there in that battlefield. One week later, on the night of the 7th of August, 
The regiment was part of one of the most famous Canadian operations of the entire war, Operation Total Ice. Under cover of darkness and a massive bomber run, and with infantry loaded into fighting vehicles, four divisions, nearly 100,000 men at full strength, were to smash through the German defensive south of Kien and take the crucial high ground overlooking the ancient Norman city of Falais. Despite the difficulties of night operations, Total Eyes made great progress. The story of Total Eyes in its opening stages is a story of, of some extraordinary uh, uh, misfortune, of, and, and also, though, of some considerable gains. I mean, again, the historians are always debating about the relative success or failure of Total Eyes. It's clear that under the circumstances in which they fought, and given the nature of the ground, and given the nature of the German defenses, that Total Eyes did some remarkable things. It pushed, broke through uh, German defenses that had been all but uh, um, undeniable. A daylight operation, codenamed Tractable, was put on a week later to finish the job. Mounted in 70 vehicles, seven abreast and ten deep, the regiment charged south through the dust and smoke towards the high ground. On that day, the 15th of August, 1944, the regiment suffered another 47 casualties. That's where they first met the German SS troops, right there, and got the hell kicked out of us. Swayze. We got into the main street and I put one platoon on the one side of the street and I was on the other. About 50 yards down, two German soldiers ran across the road with a machine gun. They were just putting it in a better position, and it being the first German any of us had ever seen, we just stood there with our mouths open and watched them run across. It was a desperate time, as the remnants of two defeated German armies tried to avoid an Allied encirclement. Well, the Falaise Gap was really uh, an extraordinary miscalculation by the Germans, created out of a divided command out of a sense of not knowing what was happening on the battlefield. Essentially what happened was that despite the Germans' insistence that they push across the Normandy Peninsula, they weren't able to do so. The result was that no less than two German armies become surrounded. The Battle of Normandy has been lost by the Germans. And the key then in the following 10 days is to see how quickly the British, the Canadians, and the Americans can seal the gap and capture the remains of no less than, than a half a million German troops. It was really a sight that, that uh, you, you, you just couldn't believe. There were thousands of dead Germans. And it doesn't take long for a person, when they're dead, to, to smell pretty bad. And the flies, this is the middle of August, it was hot weather, dusty, full of death, broken vehicles, fields of broken vehicles, tanks, trucks, armored carriers, guns. It, 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 uh, it was an unbelievable experience to see all of this, and we had to go through it. On Saturday, the 19th of August, one half-strength platoon from the Lynx, under the command of Lieutenant Junior Dunlop, reinforced a small Canadian force under Major David Curry of the South Alberta Regiment. On that fateful weekend, Curry and his men tried to block the Germans' final route of escape through the tiny village of saint lambert sur dief By then, the, the, the German uh, escape routes had been narrowed to two uh, river crossings in that village and the Canadians are left there uh, with with David Curry in command with with at least a company of the Lincoln and Welland Regiment in support and it's there then that uh, really the most climactic battle of the, of the uh, of Normandy battles for the Canadians anyway is fought trying to again ensure that the Germans don't escape out uh, into northern France. The first generation of the Lincoln and Welland Regiment passed through a bitter initiation in Normandy. Prepared through four years of training, the regiment lost 253 men, including 60 killed, 
in just three weeks. Its fighting power in the four rifle companies was cut in half. All four of its company commanders became casualties. The regiment had also lost its commanding officer. The second generation of the Lincoln and Wallen Regiment had little time to celebrate its victory in Normandy, nor mourn its dead. Under the new command of Colonel Bill Crum, the regiment found its place in convoy pushing towards the next German defensive position to the north, the Sien River. A journey that now takes just several hours was far more difficult in 1944. Blown bridges, traffic snarls along winding roads and the occasional enemy columns caused endless delays. But the grateful French citizens who stood waving at the long columns passing by were never forgotten. On the 26th of August, the regiment reached the banks of the Seine. For the next three days, the regiment and its sister units, the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders of Canada from Hamilton, and the Algonquin Regiment from North Bay, fought for the heights. The pursuit into Belgium followed the spectacular British capture of Antwerp in early September. On the morning of the 9th of September, one company of the Lynx crossed the Ghent Canal just south of the historic city of Brugge to support an Argyle attack that had been cut off the night before. The battle for the village of Moorbrugge was a tough introduction to the fighting of Western Belgium. Flat, often flooded land crossed by canals and defended by a determined enemy meant one thing, Canadian casualties. Just over a year after liberation, the Belgian town of Eclou plays host to its Canadian liberators. The Lincoln and Welland Regiment from southern Ontario parades to the cemetery, the Abigem. In honor of their dead comrades, wreaths are placed on the cenotaph by Major Swayze, the acting O.C. For the three-day visit, the town of Eclou is in a holiday spirit. Manners leave no doubt in Canuck minds of the goodwill of Belgian citizens. The town burgomaster, Robert Stacer, inspects the regiment prior to making the presentation of a banner in token of the liberation. In reciprocation for the honor bestowed on them, the O.C. Lincoln and Wellens presents the dignitary with a captured German sword suitably inscribed. Acts of international goodwill such as this will go a long way in future years to keep the world in fellowship at peace. The 16th of October came new orders. Antwerp had been liberated, but the approaches to this vital port remained in German hands. Beginning on the 20th of October, the regiment began its part in a four-division push north of the city. Operation Suitcase began well, but the forested sandy soil along the Dutch border was laden with mines that made the tanks especially vulnerable. A picture emerges here of a series of intense, isolated battles. On one occasion, Major Jim Dandy lost half of his company fighting over open ground to relieve the Argyle's attack on the village of Wusha Plantash. The advance continued until the rainy afternoon of Friday the 27th of October, when the regiment moved to the outskirts of the ancient Dutch city of Bergen op Zoom. Intelligence was sketchy as to whether the Germans would hold the town. An unknown to the Canadians, the city's mayor had refused to evacuate the city of civilians the day before. Instead, the German garrison loosely interpreted their withdrawal orders and withdrew north of the Somme River. Just then, all of a sudden, a bloody artillery comes down. Boom, 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 like that. It's sitting on the bloody street where I'm laying with this, with this guy. I'm holding him, Roscoe, you know? And, uh, geez, I don't know what the hell's going on, you know? 
And then all of a sudden, a jeep comes tearing down. They're shelling the street. And this jeep, it's our CSM, our company sergeant major, Sue Campbell. And he come tearing down the street and slams his brakes on. He sees me laying there with Roscoe and, and come on, come on, he's yelling at me. And, and I just scooped him up. And he had, we had camouflage nets sometimes we put over our helmets. He had one around his neck like a scarf, you know, tucked inside of his battle jacket. And when I'm carrying him from there into the Jeep, I mean, I knew he was dead. I should have known, you know, you see a lot of guys die. Like his eyes had rolled up and he's as white as a sheet. And, uh, but you know, he's your buddy. So anyway, I'm carrying him into the Jeep and his head fell back. I didn't hear, he drowned right away in his own blood, I guess. But that was it. So much for my experience at Bergen up Zoom. A lot of casualties were taken from, from mines and from snipers. The difficulties of crossing open country in that area are best reflected in the, in the attack that, that uh, Major Dandy takes at C Company, which, which is left out in the open, uh, moving towards uh, Bergen op Zoom. The pursuit of the German armies into Belgium and Holland cost the regiment a second generation of soldiers. In early November of 1944, the regiment was positioned near the south shore of the Maas River. Patrolling across its swift, cold currents was dangerous work. On the night of the 11th of December 1944, eight members of the regiment were lost, presumed drowned. Everyone was on guard during that Christmas of 1944. A massive German counter-offensive had surprised the Allied forces 11 days before and the Canadians stood ready to defend against another attack from across the Maas. At that time, a long, empty island in the river was an obvious point of concern. There, a small but determined group of German paratroopers held a ferry harbour named Kapelschwehr. On New Year's Eve 1945, General Maxek's 1st Polish Armoured Division dispatched three companies of infantry to drive the Germans from Kapelschwehr. The Poles were repulsed at a cost of 49 casualties. A week later, the Poles launched Operation Mouse with a larger force. Again, they failed to take the harbour, suffering 133 casualties. In another week's time, the British 47th Royal Marine Commando launched Operation Horse. They also failed. On the morning of the 26th of January, an elaborate artillery plan marked the beginning of the Canadian attack on Kapelschewir, Operation Elephant. As three companies of infantry approached the harbour along the island's high, exposed dikes, a canoe force tried to paddle into the objective under cover of smoke. Jim Dandy, he decided he'd, he'd do the attack himself with Charlie Company. So I was held in reserve. I was his 2IC then. Kept me in reserve, and he took two or three officers with him. And uh, they went up to the east side. And below them, lower down on the dike, was Lambert with A Company. And he went up the same place. That was the first attack, the initial attack, uh, with no, not much help or anything, and slippery sides. And they hadn't a chance to get through. Dandy got up a little piece, and he got wounded. That put him out of action for the rest of the war. His officers, I think they were either killed or wounded, all of them. I fought this battle a thousand times in my mind, and, and I feel very badly that I did what I did, but I did what I was told, and I know better than that. I should have. I've been commanding long enough to know better than that. The two senior officers were out. I was put in charge of the both companies. There was about 65 of us, and Bill Dickey was there with me. He was from A Company, and I was from Charlie Company. So we went around from there, around to the other side of the, of the Udamas, where Jim Swayze was in charge of the battle. And uh, he sent us through then up to the dike, over on the west side of the dike, next to Ed Brady Dickey. He took 60 men and about 10 canoes, trained them, 
up on a side river and uh, how to paddle their way down the river and they all had rifles and they all had stems and uh, they were ready to tear in behind the Germans and tear them apart. Well, there was a few things that interfered. One was the Germans right on the other side of the river could shoot them just like ducks on the river, and they did. Then there was ice that stopped the canoes from getting into the shore, and a lot of them got drowned. I was told by the lieutenant to stay close to the ice on our side because they're starting to smoke about this time in the area. And uh, you stay close enough to the ice so you don't go over in the German side of the water and you can lose yourself in smoke. So I was staying close to that. And then all of a sudden the wind changed and away went the smoke. We were left. And it was just breaking daylight at this time and it was cold, cold, cold. And the first shot that was fired from the German side, I got. I was in the front of the boat. But 15 seconds later, the guy in the back of the boat got a whole burst of machine gun fire and tore off part of his head. And he fell out. So I ended up without a paddle. I could, didn't get his paddle, and they tore mine in two because I was hit in the hand. I lost that finger and almost that one. What I did see, well, you know, looking around in that, you see that the 88s were picking boats off and they were just going, gone and uh, machine guns were hitting guys and they were falling out into the water. The boat just disappeared. You could see it go boom and gone. The boat was gone. Of course there was, they were canvas, you know, and that. They weren't too well built boats. The bodies just disappear when those shells hit them. Only 28 reached the island out of the 66 and seven come out without being wounded or killed. They had a hard time breaking to the frontal attack, had a hard time there, and they had a hard time from there on. One of the main reasons was the Germans were dug in and we were and couldn't get dug in. So you had to find a place where there was a little bit of a knoll of any kind and lay down behind it. And it's ice cold. It must have come down from one of them up above say, we're taking it regardless. For what? They could have bypassed it and would have died. You don't know that until you're through or almost through. You hear this. You hear words about what we're doing is for nothing. A hell of a thing to be told. But they knew that the difficulties of getting a landborne force onto that objective without being detected was going to be a very, very difficult thing. The only way they figured that they could get somebody on it quickly was to come in a direction and by a means that nobody had thought of before. And so if I was a planner in January of 1945, it may well have been an idea that, that given the, the, the costly attacks that the Poles and the, and the commandos had made, that it might well have been. There was the only alternative to, yet again, another difficult landborne operation. Some very, very brave young Canadian guys volunteered to try to take an innovative and ultimately uh, impossible objective. And they did it with an enormous tenacity. They did it despite the cold, despite the failed smoke, despite the failed element of surprise, despite how closely the Germans had registered the, the positions. A lot of guys died out there and, 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 and yet, you know, the, to me the, the, the ultimate lesson of it all was that the Lynx survived it and that the Lynx managed to prevail in what were clearly absolutely horrible conditions. Canadians and the Allies had developed a doctrine which was slow and ponderous, costly but effective. And what we find time and again is that we keep questioning that doctrine because it's slow and ponderous and costly but effective, and we keep challenging it, and we do it at Capel Severe. We decide that the old standard rules of artillery and slow infantry coordination aren't going to work there. And likely, you know, there's a good reason to suggest that. But as we find, once you begin to apply those basic rules of, of infantry and tank coordination and artillery coordination, the objective was taken after five days. It wasn't taken after 
several hours as perhaps the initial plan had, had suggested, but ultimately it was taken in, in, in the same slow, ponderous, but effective way that the Canadians have become very good at. The battle for Capel Chevier was a turning point in the wartime history of the Lincoln and Welland Regiment, but that should not lessen the importance of the role played by the regiment's fourth generation. That generation was led by Lieutenant Colonel Rowan Coleman, a veteran of North Africa, Sicily and Italy. Coleman had several weeks to rebuild his unit before it moved east, towards the last series of defences before Germany itself, the Rhineland. The Rhineland defences that the Germans held had been developed in 1936, after Germany had reoccupied the Rhineland to the west of the Rhine River. And so those are the central German defenses that they were going to hold before or if and when the Allies would attack into Germany itself. And so if ever there was a set of defensive positions that the Germans wanted to hold at all costs, it was in the Rhineland, the classic killing zone, in which uh, the, the, the gap narrowed, the gun positions were clearly trained, and the only way of advance was through this very narrow gap that, uh, that would cost hundreds, if not thousands, of Canadian lives. The regimental convoy crossed the Rhine River on the last day of March 1945 and headed north back across the Dutch border. Reports of collapsing resistance brought the regiment to yet another canal, the 20th Canal, just south of the town of Delden. Colonel Coleman dispatched two companies on the initial crossing. Major Swayze's A Company crossed with little trouble, but Major Dunlop's C Company was almost completely surrounded when the Germans began to counterattack towards the canal. A fellow by the name of Cliff Chalice took over. He was a private soldier. He'd been with the transport. And uh, this was his first real go at that uh, private soldier fighting, and he did a marvelous job. He took over that, that house. He shot a pile of Germans. He got uh, hit by a grenade in the one arm, and it got broke. He would load the Bren gun over, tied it over his shoulder with a strap, have one of the wounded guys in the house load it up, and he kept charge of all the Germans coming in from the east. And it was our job to watch the ones in the in the barn and around the other side. And uh, this went on for a long time in the night. Late in the evening of the 3rd of April, the situation became so desperate that Major Dunlop called the artillery down on his own position. The tactic worked. By the morning of the 4th of April, 1945, Del Den was in Canadian hands. Clifford Chalice was on his way to hospital he would be awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for his role in the battle for Delden. This was a company commander's war as small groups cautiously probed forward, often at night, trying to isolate or bypass any isolated pockets of resistance. Through Sohel, Wölt and Lodop, the regiment moved north towards Machhausen and Freisoyth. On the 18th of April, the regiment was ordered across the Kusten Canal to strengthen a fragile bridgehead created by the Algonquins and the Argyles. Six days later, the regiment fought across the Aur River towards the village of Sud Idvet. Noted the regimental war diary in those final days, progress was very slow against fanatical resistance by the enemy. The regiment reached its final objective, Bad Zwischenhahn, in the early days of May 1945, the end was near. In that time, Colonel Coleman asked Major Swayze, who had led the regiment's first attack ten months before, to lead what turned out to be the regiment's last. Finally, at 1 a.m. Saturday, the 5th of May 1945, the regiment received the long-awaited orders, all offensive operations cancelled forthwith, a ceasefire, 0800 hours, 5 May 1945. All units stand fast until further notice. <laughs>
Suddenly there was no more shells going off, there was nobody, nobody shooting at you and things of that sort. It was a, almost as if it was anticlimactic that, uh, you know, um, the show was over type of thing. It was a very quiet, sober moment. I guess the first thing you thought about, well, how soon were we going to get home? Uh, things of that sort. But uh, it was a big relief in many respects. But um, I can't say that, uh, you know, everybody was... Well, we were elated. We were happy, but uh, uh, it was a sort of subdued happiness because you, you kept thinking of the guys that hadn't made it who had gone so far and only a few days before had been killed. A story that had begun on the streets of St. Catharines, Ontario, six years before, ended in the same place. On Tuesday, the 29th of January, 1946, the last members of the Lincoln and Welland Regiment returned to its armories on Lake Street. At the head of the parade was Lieutenant Colonel James Fletcher Swayze, DSO, a Niagara Falls native who had signed on as a lieutenant in 1940. Colonel Swayze dismissed the regiment for the last time that day, but its traditions and battle honors continue on. Between the 6th of June, 1944, and the 5th of May, 1945, the Lincoln and Welland Regiment sustained 1,548 casualties. 348 of these men never returned home. Most are buried in Commonwealth War grave cemeteries throughout Europe, close to where they fell. They should never be forgotten. These guys were part of a generation that didn't draw attention to themselves. And they were part of a generation of people that grew up in the Depression, that grew up and did absolutely remarkable things in the Second World War. And it seems to me that the closer one actually got to battle, the closer one actually got to the fighting, and this certainly doesn't take anything away from the people who were working very hard in the rear echelons, but I don't think that any of us can understand what their experience was about. That uh, many of them never talked about it. Many of these people simply were not capable, I don't think anybody is, is capable of telling us what that experience was like. And so in that context, I suppose, once we be, that's where I think it's so important for us to try to understand what their experience was about, because if, if, we, if we let that memory pass, I think we'll, we'll do a disservice to this generation of people, that these are people who, who, who who went off and did some absolutely remarkable things, unbelievable things, things that n few people can put into words. And so there is a sense, I think, of, of, of a kind of moral outrage that inspired many of these fellas, even though they didn't talk about it. There was a sense of expectation among their friends, among their peers, among their, within their family, within their community and their church, that this was something that was profoundly evil and that that evil had to be stopped by force of arms. And so, you know, this little country of 11 million people puts almost a million people in uniform after 1939. Absolutely remarkable effort. In, uh, and, and it's something that we, we, we absolutely can't forget. The Second World War honors would include Falaise, the Laison, Marbrug, the Scheldt, the Lower Mars, Kapelschwehr, the Rhineland, the Hochwald, 20 Canal, Northwest Europe, 1944-1945. The world, the USA, our allies, Britain, and these other countries, you know, when they get into problems, we have all this stuff like Kosovo, and there'll be future things, and and as a nation, you're expected to, to help out with peacekeepers or actual fighting if it's necessary. And uh, 
then we have little things like ice storms and riots and so forth. And if we don't have some framework of army, I think it's a disastrous state of affairs. If you had a, a tornado or something that was to hit this area, who'd be the first ones that would be on the spot? Would be the Lincoln and Wellum. To learn about the history of the regiment and all the things that have happened before, you get a real sense of pride and belonging to an important institution, an important Canadian institution. As you know, this regiment goes back before Canada was even a country. We are here in place in the event of uh, an emergency we can assist. Peacekeeping in Somalia to Yugoslavia to Cambodia to the Middle East, I think Canada's played a very big role. I remember actually being on a, a university field trip to, uh, it was to Quebec and to Ottawa, and it was just after the peacekeeping monument had been built. And we drove by it and the prof said, oh, if you just look out to your right, you'll see the, the new peacekeeping monument. I remember a, a young lady in the bus saying, well, what, what are their soldiers doing on a peacekeeping monument? What do soldiers have to do with peacekeeping? It has been said that Peacekeeping is not a job for soldiers, but only soldiers can do it. When you're going to put someone in between two opposing armies, it has to be someone that those armies will respect. Soldiers respect soldiers. Canadians go in, they're professional, both sides know it, and it makes the peacekeeping job easier. Being that we are Canadians, they put a lot of faith in, in, in the Canadian soldiers. They would put a, a Canadian corporal in charge of a road move several hundred of kilometers to, uh, to hostile areas, to volatile areas, whereas they wouldn't put officers or sergeants in charge of, from other countries in charge of these things. They trusted Canadians to do that, and I was involved in quite a few of those. So we felt, felt very proud as Canadians to be trusted to do these sort of things. Soldiers go over to these beaten down, broken up countries, and they lift mines up so little kids won't step on them and blow themselves up and get killed. They remove booby traps. They decommission tanks and guns and they get weapons turned in. They actually do something real, something that maybe we in Canada can't see, but something that's saving lives somewhere else. And it's a hell of a lot more than just waving a placard that anyone could do, really. It must be remembered that peacekeeping is not the military's primary role. It's a secondary role. It is something we do. It's something we do well. But we train for war and we're here in case there is another war. Some people will say for when there is another war. Peacekeeping is something we can do, something that gets us out of the country, gets us working with other militaries, uh, expands our horizons, practices us, and I think for the military it's important to have a role like that. I do think, however, we have to keep in mind it's a secondary role. Aid to civil power is an important role of the reserves, of the militia, um, in times of disaster, the blizzard of 77. I mean, how many lives were saved? How do you put a dollar figure on a life? Who else could have done that? The most recent call, which was the ice storm, and there was no shortage of hands within hours to put together hundreds of militiamen from within this area, the Niagara Peninsula through to London, put together hundreds of men and women willing to, to take time off work or time off school or out of university exams to go assist fellow Canadians. As fiscal realities dictate that there has to be changes within the big picture, the big military system, I think it even reinforces in my mind more that we need a stronger and more effective and larger militia, that it provides a very cost-effective resource that we can't otherwise have. When the reserves are called on, we have to come out. We have to perform. Because if we don't, who will? Uh, there is no one after us. We're the last resort. If not us, then who?